Lydia Rogers. So there's two reasons why we want to do digital accessibility. And one is, of course, it's the right thing to do. But the other thing is, it's the law. Now, it's actually been the law for 10 years. But it was an extension of the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act. But it was, was somewhat done by some companies. But two years ago, in 2017, some lawyers saw a great opportunity for earning money. And they found vulnerable websites. And then they found people who could not access those websites if they chose to go on them, and they sued. And they won. Beyonce's been sued. Playboy's been sued. One of the scariest web, uh, website lawsuits was against Winn-Dixie, which is a big grocery store chain down south. They did not get a monetary fine, which that's sort of good. But they were found their website was not accessible. And the court gave them a week-by-week -week checklist of what they had to do. They were under court order to do certain things every week. And other things they might have thought they were going to do with their business ground to a halt while they met those court orders. Right now, it seems like California and New York are the two states where a lot of these web, uh, website lawsuits are going on. But no one thinks it'll stay there. It's going to keep spreading. 2017 was big. There was an explosion. 2018 was even bigger. So for web pages and for any kind of digital content, that would be the web page itself, a linked document, like a PDF, or embedded media. All those need to be accessible. If you'd like some, and by the way, I'll give you the link at the end for the slideshow. If you'd like some great resources on what's required, ada.gov and section508.gov. Those both talk about the law, what's allowed or required. Now, there's four major areas of accessibility that we're supposed to address. Cognitive, motor skills, vision, and hearing. Hearing, I, Vision and hearing, I think most people think of automatically. Hearing, either deaf or have hearing problems, hearing loss. Vision, either only partial vision or no vision. Motor skills are, you know, you think of Stephen Hawking when he made his computer work with his eyes. That, that has become more mainstream now. So someone who cannot use a mouse easily. Now Stephen Hawking is a very dramatic, was a very dramatic example, but there are older people who just have severe arthritis and they have trouble moving with a mouse. So they need motor skills help. And cognitive, I personally tend to think of as the most interesting, especially if you have any kind of public information, health, education, anything where you expect a broad spectrum they want you to keep in mind the cognitive level. And there's three reasons to keep the paragraph simple, the sentences simple, the words simple. And the first reason is someone does not have a high IQ, but they're being mainstreamed in society. So if they're holding a job, and they're paying taxes, and they're doing things, probably with support, but still they're out there on their own, they should be able to understand information on the web. The next is someone whose IQ is fine, but English is not their first language. Again, if you have information that should be accessible to many people, bear in mind that English may be a second or a third language. And the third is IQ's fine. They grew up speaking American English. However, they just got bad news. And especially if you're in the healthcare field or anything like that, certain kinds of law, I'm sure we've all been there when we get very potentially devastating news and we read the same paragraph over and over and over again. We have no idea what we read. If you have something that it would be reasonable to think that someone is going to be on your website and they may be in that position, of course, we'll all be in that position at some point. But especially if you're going to have a larger percentage, they want you to bear in mind the cognitive issues. Make it simple. Keep it bullet points. Bear in mind these people are going through a lot right now. Today we're going to focus on vision and hearing. Now the types of content are web pages, PDFs, Microsoft Word or Google Docs that maybe you upload or embed, and YouTube videos. So the written word. The first thing that should happen is text should reflect an outline format, just like we used to do in school. So you have the title, then you have the section or chapter heading, then you have a subsection heading, and then you have the paragraphs. The reason is that screen readers for the blind have technology, and they actually read the code in the back end. 
So when someone with a sight impairment says, okay, tell me what is on this page, the screen reader will say, well, the title is, because it's looking for the code title. And then it'll say the main sections are, and it'll read the H1s. And then it'll, well, probably only one H1. Then it'll read the H2s. And then it'll read the H3s. And this allows someone with a sight impairment to drill down to where they want to go. In essence, what we're trying to achieve is the same experience someone with no vision problems achieves. So when any of us go to, well, mostly when we go to a website, we go, here's a piece of information I want. We go, scan, 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 and say, ah, that's what I want. We don't read the whole page. And the idea is that the sight impaired who are using screen readers should not have to listen to three minutes of content until finally it gets to the point where they want the information. So for instance, if you have how to apply to college, that might be the title of your web page or your document. Then your subject uh, sections are application details, financial aid, supporting documents. Oops. Then within that, under application details, if they say, I want to know more about application details, you go, well, there's two sections, college-specific applications and the Common App. And then you get down into the nitty gritty. So you go, OK, I want application details. And they say, I want the college-specific applications. And now they can drill down to read that content. And the reason the screen reader knows how to do that drilling down is it's reading in the back end. H2, here you go, here's a section. Within that section, here's an H3, maybe even an H4, depending on how complicated the page is. It allows them to drill down to what they want. Images. Images are very important. Among other things, when a screen reader comes to um, an image. What it'll say is, blah, 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 um, welcome to Boston University. And then the screen reader will literally say, here is a picture of. And after the word of, what gets filled in is whatever we have put in the alt text. And alt text is the behind the scenes description of the, vi of the image. So if we haven't put anything, it says, welcome to Boston University. Here is a picture of image. Two things happen. One is, of course, the image didn't convey any information to the sight impaired. But possibly more frustrating is they have no idea whether that loss is important or not. Maybe the image is just a decorative flower. It really tells nothing. It's just a, a visual element. But they don't know that. It's like, oh, great, what did I miss out on? So one of the things you can even put in the alt text is visual design, visual or decorative element, saying, no, no information here. We just wanted to make the page look pretty. But if there is information, then you put that. And it should convey to the sight impaired person the same sorts of information the sighted person gets. So let's say it's a picture of a doctor's office, doctors administering a, a needle to a patient. So we sighted people look at it and say, OK, good, I understand. It's a doctor giving a, a shot of some type to some patient. That's what the alt text would say. What you don't have to do is you don't have to go overboard and say, Doctor administering shot to a patient in an office painted with blue walls. There is a pencil cup on the desk. You don't have to get into details that don't add to the understanding. So here's how you put in alt text on a picture. So for instance, if you're in WordPress and you have a picture, this is from the National Fish and Wildlife uh, U.S. National Fish and Wildlife Service. They have awesome pictures, by the way. So if you go in, and then when you highlight the picture, you click on the little edit pencil. And that will take you to the back end, where it literally will say alternative text. And then you can fill in the alternative text. And whatever you type there is what the screen reader will read. So for instance, in this case, the screen reader would say, text, text, text. Here's a picture of a chipmunk at Trustum Pond National Wildlife Refuge in Rhode Island. And then it cuts off, but then it would say it was photo by the Wildlife Service in the public domain. So it gives the information. If you're in a Word document and you put a picture in, 
It's really nice in the newer in, uh, the versions of Word. If you go up top, have you ever seen that? It says, tell me what you want to do. You just type up and tell me what you want to do. Say, I want alt text. And it'll literally give you this little box. And you can fill in, again, whatever you want in the little box. And so here, this one says, herring gull and shorebirds in the water at Sandy Point, Rhode Island. This text will not be seen by most people who are just looking at a computer screen in the, what we consider the usual way. This will only be picked up by a screen reader. With the exception of some, some everyday computers now have, when you hover over a picture, you'll see something pop up. Some computers now will pop up with the alt text. But this is just an invisible contribution from 90% of the people who are looking at the picture. But the people who need the visual explanation, that's what the screen reader reads them. Now what if you have an older version of Word? Well, you can go up to, you know, the top left where it says File, go to File, go to Info, go to Inspect Documents, and then just click on Check Accessibility. And at that point, it'll still walk you through the same part. Pops up with a little box, you fill it in. So Google Docs. Google Docs is also easy. So you've got a picture in Google Docs. And then all you do is highlight the picture, right click, and you'll see the option is alt text. So you literally click on alt text. And then again, you fill in the description. And you'll notice Google actually gives a more complete explanation of what you're doing. It says alt text is accessed by screen readers for people who might have trouble seeing your content. So it's telling you, because some old text boxes just say fill it in, and if you don't know, like, what the heck is this? <clears throat> Google explains it. Now I will tell you, making Adobe PDFs accessible <coughs> excuse me, is a little bit trickier. <coughs> so what you do is, you have your document with your information. And up in the top left, if you're in Adobe Acrobat Pro, there's something called Tools. So you click on Tools. And then when you click on that, there's all kinds of tools. And you find the option, as you can see here, it's a little purplish button, it says Action Wizard. You want the Action Wizard. And once you click on that, it will now appear to the right of your document. And you'll notice that there's a list of accessibilities and other action wizard actions. So what you do on the action wizard is you say, make it accessible. And then you click on start. And it'll walk you through. Now for some reason, I, I don't understand one of the things Adobe does. When this first box comes in, it leaves it, you know, leave as is as the default check-in. So it would be real easy to go past here. I'm not sure why they make that the default. But what you do is you uncheck all these boxes. And now you fill in. What's the title of the page? What's the subject? Who's the author? Are there any keywords? The reason keywords become important is if you're embedding this in a website and you're not sure exactly how somebody's going to search it, then you want to put all the possibilities of how somebody on your website might be looking for this PDF. So again, using the college application uh, example, so somebody might put in application. Somebody might put in go to college. Somebody might put in college first steps. You try to think of all the ways people might be searching for your document and put that in keywords so in the back end um, it'll show up. Now you indicate whether this is a fillable form. If you're just putting in a document, it says, oh, here you go, you can either print it out or you can look at it, there's, there's no interaction. Then you say, no, skip this step. But if you say, yes, it's a fillable form, then what Adobe does is it now designates, the, and it's really good at this, I'm impressed. They, make, they designate where the lines are. Will you fill in name, address, phone, email, whatever you fill in so that it's readable in the back end by a screen reader. It'll say, okay, you come to a line name, fill that in, and it allows them to type in. And the system will also check for alt text. 
So what it'll do is, so it's come to this picture, and you'll see the, another box pops up. So that's the good news. The little box pops up, and this is image one of one, but if you have many images, you fill in literally what the alt text is. And then the other thing, you see in the sort of like top right, it says decorative. That's the part that I was talking about that you put in really there's nothing to be uh, gained by this picture. So you just tell it, yep, this is a decorative element. Don't worry about it. It's just decorative. And then when you're finished, you run the check, and it'll give you a box with all these things. Just usually leave it with the default. And that's what it'll look like. And then it'll come back, and it'll tell you all the things that came up that were issues, or potential issues. Now you'll see the blue little question marks. It's saying logical reading order needs a manual check, meaning there's no machine that can check that. And then color balance. Again, this is for someone who has a color blindness. It says that also needs a check, because if you have text against a background color that don't have enough contrast, you want to know that ahead of time and possibly make alterations. And now you see that in this particular sample document, the title field failed. There's no question mark there. It doesn't say you better check it. It says it failed. And this is a real subtlety. What you need to do in the title field is, and that goes back to that first box we <coughs> filled in. There we go. If that title isn't filled in, it prompts you and says, hey, you need a title. And if you forgot to fill it in, at the check at the end, it'll say you still need the, file, the, the name. The logical reading order, my guess is this is going to change sometime, because this is um, craziness. You want to click on logical reading order. Look, if you have a PDF, if you've ever created any kind of Word document, you've probably done something like, say, title, how to make an appointment. And then you'll say, oh, I'm going to put the email in. You put the email in, but it's going to be on the bottom of the page. And you say, OK, I'm going to write my paragraph of what I'm going to say. Oh, I've got to say, call Dr. Jones. I'm going to put Dr. Jones' phone number. And then I'm going to say, here's our address. And then I'm going to say, here's our testimonials. And you're putting them in as you think of them. And then once you've got them all on the page, then you rearrange them. For reasons I don't understand, screen readers don't read the finished product the way we see it on both PDFs and PowerPoint. Screen readers read them in the order they were put in. Um, this has to change at some point, but it hasn't changed yet. So now a screen reader will say, how to apply for college, email. Well, what? And then it'll say, uh, blah, 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 introduction, telephone number. Blah, 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 here's our address, and it's off on some other topic, and it's off on some other topic and it's this hodgepodge of information. So there are two ways to approach that. One is, if at all possible, you kind of map out ahead of time so you put everything in in order. Sometimes life doesn't work that way. The good news is, um, if you, in the Adobe Acrobat Pro, in the tool, this tool, if you rearrange the elements, they will now be read by screen readers. Screen readers will now read them in order. So you can do the manual change in this tool. Now another thing that is needed is YouTube transcriptions. Oh, well, just about any, but YouTube is really good. I'm sure you looked uh, a couple of years ago, if you ever watched closed captioning, it wasn't so good. Because some of the closed captions were in unintentionally funny. They've gotten much, 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 much better. But if you need closed captions on your videos, it's important, even if YouTube has done all the work for you, that you read them and make sure they're accurate. And one of the reasons is, again, using a medical example, if the doctor is saying, and now you drink water. This is very important. Now you drink water. And YouTube says, now you do not drink water. Well, that can be, it's just one letter. YouTube only missed it by one letter. But that's a huge difference. So you, and I'm, <laughs> I mean, you just got to sit there and slough through it. There's no shortcut on this. You sit there, watch the video with the closed captions, and make sure they match up. So if you want to do closed captioning on YouTube, 
You automatically have a YouTube account if you have any kind of Google account, Gmail, anything. So what you do is you go to your account and you go to your library. It's important to know you can only edit YouTube transactions or transcriptions rather for videos you own and that are on your channel. So if you see somebody else's video and you say, oh, that's appalling, uh, you, can't, you can possibly message them, but you cannot touch it yourself, nor can anyone touch your transcriptions. So it's gotta be on your channel, and if you have a YouTube account, you automatically have a channel, and it's, uh, it's gotta be your, your video. So if you upload somebody else's video and YouTube recognizes it was actually created by somebody else and you're just uploading it for some reason, they probably won't let you touch it. So what you do is you go to your library and you go to edit video. So this part actually is pretty easy. You just click on edit video there on the right. And then you click on transcriptions. And when you click on transcriptions, on the right, you'll see it's going to give one automatic English, and then below that, it will say, do you want to add? And so you say, yes, I would like to add this. And by the way, there's a million languages. You can choose another language. And then you click on the little add there. And now you select the method of how you want to do the transcriptions. Probably one of the easier ways is the middle one, to transcribe in auto-sync. But I will just say, upload a file means, let's say it's a script, it's like a skit you did. You know what everybody was going to say. You had this um, on a Word document. You can upload this to YouTube. And YouTube will take that Word document and put that in as your transcription. Now you just do some tweakings to make sure it came in the way you expected. But you can do that. But if you did something more like a little Q&A with somebody and it's not scripted, you're either going to want to create new subtitles or closed captions, or you want to transcribe in auto-sync. In both cases, you're doing more typing, at least in YouTube. Auto-sync, YouTube will try to match up the printed word with the person talking on the screen. It's not 100% perfect, and you can tweak it, but that's a nice start. If you do create new subtitles, you're saying, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to type in the words. I'm going to make sure it syncs with the, the what's happening on the screen. And so, um, Usually the middle one's the easier one to do. Transcribe and let YouTube help you. Here's a subtlety with YouTube transcriptions. Many people think, well, as long as I have the audio, whatever anybody says, translated and transcripted, we're good. If somebody's sight impaired, well, they can still, as long as they can still hear fine, they heard everything on the video. But actually, what you also need to do is have notes in brackets for the sight impaired. Because if somebody says, OK, now with, the ex um, with this exercise, what we're going to do is reach like I'm doing right now. Well, that doesn't mean anything. So in the little transcription, you say reach, and you put a little like, bracket and say um, presenter stretch to the left sideways or whatever. There are two approaches to this. Neither one of them are perfect. And there's big arguments going on, so I'll just tell you both and you can do what you want. One approach is people have, they do the YouTube transcriptions for the hearing impaired. Just straightforward. And now for the sight impaired, they do a Word document. And you can actually download the YouTube transcription or copy and paste it, put it in your own Word document. And in that Word document, they add the elements where what's on the screen is important. So the presenter says, well, as you can see here, we had quite a record breaker for rainfall. Record breaker, how it was drier, it was wetter. So you could put in, but the graph shows it, but the presenter didn't say it. You can put that in the Word document. And then, next to your video, you can have a link. For uh, vision accessibility, click here. And it can go to your PDF. Having said that, I'll tell you one area of contention at the moment, and, and the powers that be haven't decided yet, is the law says that if you need accessibility, you should have as close as possible the same experience as someone who does not need accessibility. And there is a very vocal argument right now that if you give somebody a video and you say, everybody except the sight impaired, you, you're on this page, you get what you need. 
However, sight impaired people, you must take an extra click and go to this other place. It's an extra click. That's, that's being vigorously argued right now, whether that's an equal access or not, making them do the extra click. The other option is, which also isn't perfect, is you keep them on the video page or the embed page and you do things in brackets. The problem with that is, if someone hasn't recorded it with lots of breathing room in between, you don't have a whole lot of room to be putting in explanations. So the presenter says, and now stretch sideways to the left like this, pause, and now we'll touch our toes. Well, there isn't enough room in that little pause to put in brackets and say, presenter at this point stretch sideways to the left or the right or whatever. And either they get something that's said so fast, they can't possibly understand what was said, or you've got two voices talking over each other, depending on the system they're on. So again, not a perfect answer. So just letting you know, the vision requirements for any kind of video are still being argued and they're not perfect. So you just come up with the best option you can. Another subtlety, subtlety when you're doing a transcription for someone who's hearing impaired is you need to um, understand when they don't know subtleties. And another subtlety is, let's say someone's on the screen and it's a man and he's saying, yes, and when I was younger, I always loved the, the, this dish my mother made. And then in the background, we hear the mother saying, yes, you always did love it. So we know it's a woman's voice, it's his mother in the background, and we know she's just chimed in off camera. However, the hearing impaired person sees a man who says, I always loved this dish my mother made. Yes, you always did love it. Well, that didn't make any sense because they don't understand the second voice just came in. So what you need to do again in brackets, you go, he says, I love this dish my mother made. And then you put in brackets, mother off screen can be heard saying, yes, you did love it. So it explains. Also, if somebody is doing something and they have, well, first of all, if they have a copyright something and they're using it legitimately, you do want to make note of that. So, you know, this song, you know, in brackets, in the background playing XYZ song by so and so. The other time you want to make note of any kind of song is, is if the lyrics are relevant to what they're saying. So they'll say something like, you know, that sunset was so moving, and then they'll pause. And in the background, you hear a song singing about lovely sunsets. You want to put, so the hearing impaired person isn't. It looks like nobody's talking at the moment, so they know this person said there were lovely sunsets and then just sitting there, not doing anything. So you want to put in brackets as of, you know, right now, so-and-so musician is playing the song, Beautiful Sunset, and if it makes sense, you actually put in the lyrics. Lyrics are blah, blah, blah. So now the hearing impaired person still understands what the person who doesn't have hearing impairments gathered from this piece. By the way, I tell you all these, all the pluses and minuses here. Another thing is if, if you have a website and you're at all concerned, I mentioned Winn-Dixie at the beginning, go to Winn-Dixie and check out their accessibility policy. It's a great thing to use because the court told them what to say. So you have some legal backing. But in essence, an accessibility statement addresses all the things we're saying now. And in non-legal language, what it says is, hey, look, we know our website isn't totally accessible. Because right now, nobody's website is totally accessible. We know our website's not totally accessible, but we're working on it. And if for some reason you have content you can't reach, you know, email us here or call us here, let us know what page it is, and we're working on it. And the courts at this point anyway, at this point seem to look on that very favorably. So if somebody comes and says, ah, this page wasn't accessible. And the court said, yes, but they've got this accessible. And look, they've got this statement down here saying, look, we know we're not perfect, but we're, we're working on it. Here's how you get a hold of us if you need the information. And that seems to buy some time. And that's the sort of thing when you have that whole, do we do a separate video transcription for the sight impaired, or do we just squeeze it in on what we do for the hearing impaired? You kind of address, if somebody decides to call you out on whichever decision you made, you have a little bit of coverage on that, if it may or may not be important to you. 
So when you're typing in the information from the video, here's how you do it. It's actually you know, pretty straightforward. You literally type in what is being said. Now here's some resources for more information. As I say, I'm good at the end. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> at the end, I'm going to give you uh, an address for this. But Microsoft, believe it or not, Microsoft is, well, I shouldn't say believe it or not, but they're one of the leaders in um, accessibility. They've done some amazing things. So if you either want to know about accessibility for somebody else, for them to use, or you want to know some great tips, tricks, and tools to make your, web, your WordPress website or your embedded documents accessible, Microsoft is awesome. Google's good. At this point, Microsoft is a little ahead of Google, but Google's also good. Adobe's good. Only for PDFs, by the way. I mean, that's, that's what their strength is on this. But here's the long address. For the, it's on the, on the website, so you don't have to copy it unless you want to. But they have a whole thing about everything, how to make your um, PDFs more accessible. And all those little errors on the left side, if you go, what the heck do they mean by that? Like you see color contrast, what do you mean color contrast? What are you trying to tell me? They have a whole list of, here's what we're trying to tell you. And then YouTube. Again, if you want support on doing transcriptions, YouTube can help you out. So here is the short URL. So it's short short.at slash zero, capital H, capital T, eight, nine. And are there any questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering um, on the uh, audio, mm -hmm. are there subtle differences between subtitles versus closed captioning versus transcription, or are they just synonyms all meaning the same thing? So the question is, are there differences among closed caption transcriptions? What was the third one? Uh, subtitle closed Sub caption. Yeah. Sometimes. And the answer is yes and no. There are some people who are passionate about many things in life, and they'll say, no, a transcription is this, a closed caption is this. And there are other people who use the three terms interchangeably. A lot of it is context. Generally speaking, people use them interchangeably. But once in a blue moon, you'll find somebody, and you'll realize from the way they're talking that they have a very specific meaning in mind. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Yes. What about with the popularity of podcasts? Has there been any kind of chatter about transcription and making those accessible as well? Huge, yes. And again, two approaches to that. One, in the very beginning, people did the same thing as they did with the YouTube for the sight impaired, and that is they did a PDF with a transcription and did a, you know, want to know what's on our podcast? Click here and read the transcription. What more people are going to, and it seems like this is more favorably looked at by the regulators, is right on the web page. So they have one page, it's one page per podcast, which depending on your setup can be very page intensive. But so they have the podcast, you know, click to play, and immediately below it is a transcription. This podcast is about person A is such and such, person B is such and such, person A says, person B says. What doesn't exist at the moment of which I'm aware, there's some tools, but they're not as good as YouTube, is a nice, easy, pretty accurate transcription tool. There's some tools that will do a kind of good job to get you started. But you, I, I don't know if you know, but many podcasts don't transcribe. And part of the, <laughs> part of the reason is it's a there to get it done. Yes? Um, since uh, you said that accessibility has technically been a lot for the last 10 years, do you envision that some point, some government agency or somebody's going to come down and clamp down on all websites at some point to try and enforce the law? Certainly, I wouldn't rule it out. But at the moment, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a government official, so I mean, this is just my opinion, just so you know. What's my opinion? My opinion is I think the government's just as happy to take a back seat because there's enough other things going on and let the lawyers, because right now the lawyers are... are the numbers are just staggering. I mean, they're going for the big companies and what they view as the deep pockets initially. But the lawyers are in town suing websites. And I think the government's saying, no need for us to do any enforcement. By God, it's getting taken care of. So, I mean, could they? Yes, but I think, I think they're letting the lawyers take care of it. Yes? Uh, what sorts of auditing tools do you recommend? Let's pretend I have a website that's already thousands of pages and it's a mess, what do I do? Okay. 
There's a, there's a few approaches. If you don't mind spending money, there's two good companies. One is Site, okay, thank you. One is Site Improve. And what Site Improve does is um, you, you, you know, latch into your, your website to them. It's, a, it's an application. And they go through and they'll tell you. They'll say, you've got this many pages without the old text. You've got this many pages with no heading. You don't have a title on here. You don't have a subtitle. You've got nothing. They'll, they'll literally tell you all these things. And what Site Improve will tell you is that's a great first step. What they don't do necessarily at this first step is any human being. This is all machines doing this. Now, for extra money, Site Improve will um, have people go in and do some checking. So that's one approach. Another company is Essential Accessibility. Essential Accessibility, and so it's you know, E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L, Essential Accessibility. And Site Improve is S-I-T-E-I-M-P-R-O-V-E, -E, all one word. Um, essential Accessibility will do more reports. They'll say you've got all this going on. They've got more tools and some real life human beings in the background. They do less, but what they do is more thorough. Another option is, um, is you can talk with, in fact, I, I'm from Rhode Island, so I, I actually have talked, there's a um, group down in Rhode Island called Insight, and they're a group for the vision impaired. And so I asked the director, I said, hey, if I gave you some web pages, would your group be willing to look them over? So this is real life checking out. And I was very happy with the response because their reaction was, yes, <laughs> we love it. Because I was afraid they go, don't bother us. But their reaction was, thank goodness, because it's so frustrating for them to go to a website. So they're happy to, to do it. And now I'm looking for similar, you know, sight impaired, I mean, hearing impaired. So those are the options. You can do the, you know, the elbow grease your own way, or you can pay for companies to help you out. Thanks, thank you. Sure. Yes? You mentioned about um, the, the, the level of reading on certain sites to make it more simple. Now, when you're mentioning that, is that similar to what you talk about in SEO, right, for like an eighth grade level, or high school level, or college level? Is that similar or is that different? It's, it, actually, the end result is very similar. The, the reason you're going for it is different, but the end result comes up with very similar product. One of the things that many people like to point out when they're trying to preach accessibility is they go, look, Good access, it's not the be all end all the SEO by any means, but good, good accessibility helps SEO. When you have all the text on the back end of a picture, Google sees that. When you do like you say, and you've got the nice wording, it helps someone with cognitive issues for whatever reason, and it also helps with your SEO. So they're coming at it from different areas, but they end up in the same place. Yes? Um, just not a question, but um, <laughs> dealing with this as well, if you are starting out or hiring someone to build plugins or like external applications or things that you want to integrate into your site, um, checking out their accessibility as well because um, just because someone has been building things for many, many years doesn't necessarily mean that they're building correctly. And even simple things like alt tags um, may not be added into the template files or plugin um, files or any other kind of stuff. So that's also one other thing as you're thinking about this, just to be aware of those limitations as well. That was an excellent point. And what he said is when you're talking to somebody to build or rebuild or redo your website, ask them about their experience and their expertise with accessibility. Because even if they've been around for a million years, maybe they don't know that aspect of the business. Yes? Um, there is an app for transcribing that's really easy to use and fairly economical. You can leave it in the mic. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm very strong voice. I'm not used to using these either. It's probably too much. Just pull it close. Does it, does it work? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 okay, good. So there's this app called rev.com. You can, um, they have it so that you can actually take somebody on your phone and then upload it and, and they'll transcribe it. But you can just upload another form of recording. So that might be good for podcasts. If anybody wanted to upload that. Thank you. And so it's rev, R-E-V, like Victor? Yes, R-E-V dot com. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, okay. great. Well, oh, yes, yes. Um, oh, I, I just remember now. Now, when you were talking about the alt text, you mentioned that um, if you have an image that's not going to convey important information, you would 
say so in the alt text? Yeah, so let's say you just have like little leaves on the edge of the page, and the only reason they're there are for prettiness. You can, in the alt text, say decorative image. Um, I, 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 I've seen some people recommend um, making the um, uh, using an empty alt attribute for, for, for those that indicate that, that it's not important. Is that bad practice? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. What do they say you should do? Um, and so you all have to be empty instead of um, putting it in the bottle. Not, not to have omitted, but, but, but to just have empty. Oh, empty. The only, that achieves the same way in, thing in many ways. The only thing that might be frustrating for the sight impaired is they say, here's an image empty. You, you know, you have that sense of missing out. Well, what do you mean it's empty? Oh, uh, I uh, and I wasn't aware of the screen readers would, uh, would, would say here was the image of, of such and such and such, so they just, um, would just uh, uh, read the alt text, pull out of the as part of the font text. No, they, the screen readers say, and now there is a, something along the lines of, and now here is a picture of or an image of. And I understand we're out of time, so thank you very much for coming today.